Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, great to see you here today. Thank you for joining us here tonight. My name is Karen and together with my colleagues, we run the X developer relations work here in GovTech. So before we start, we'd like to run through a couple of house rules that's up on screen now. First, please note that the webinar is being recorded. We will upload it onto the developer's portal and the link will be shared shortly. We also ask that your questions be kept to the topics presented today to keep the session meaningful. And finally, please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar uh, through the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen. Please refrain from posting questions in the main chat as our speakers won't be taking questions from there. Uh, next slide, please. So tonight we are excited to have the team from GovTech's National Digital Identity share their work with us. After we share an introduction on StackX and about uh, GovTech, Quexin will kick off the session by giving an overview of the National Digital Identity Program. Next, Wongso, Donald, and Dixon will share the National Digital Identity stack, followed by a short Q&A. Uh, we will wrap up the session with Eric giving an overview of the NDI Developers Portal, which can be assessed through our Government Developers Portal, which I'll share more about later. So this will be uh, followed by a combined Q&A at the end. Um, GovTech is about 3,000 strong now, and our work can be broadly classified into three areas. Products, services, cyber, and gov cyber security and governance. So under the product team, we have over 700 developers who implement products for whole of government and develop strategic national projects. We also have capability centers in the area of digital services, sensors and IoT, data science and AI, cybersecurity and infrastructure. The product team also manages the whole of government infrastructure from our move to commercial cloud to uh, data centers to insurance of devices for all public offices. So next is the services group, uh, the biggest of the three making up about more than half of GovTech staff. They play an important role in managing technology in over 60% of government agencies in Singapore. So finally is the cybersecurity and governance group. GovTech is the sector lead for cybersecurity in the government and the government chief information security officer sits in GovTech. To ensure all the work we do is safe and secure, our governance group sets ICT policies and governance uh, and guidelines across the government as well. So below are some of the products developed by the NDI team. I will leave the team to cover uh, these in detail later. Uh, next, we'll also like to share our Singapore Government Developer Portal. The portal serves as a single place for you to discover government products as well as technical documentation, so you can give it a try out. These include the National Digital Identity, our API Gateway and DevOps products, just to name a few. We also have a community page where we post details of past webinars such as these and uh, blogs by GovTech teams as well. So the portal also links to the NDI developer portal page, which Eric will share more about later. It's still in its beta phase, so really ask for your patience that information is slowly being onboarded. If you have any feedback on how, what you'd like to see more, um, how we can make it better, we would really love to hear from you. Uh, so next, we will be holding our developer conference, Stack 2020, from the 1st to 3rd December. It's fully digital, and what's best is it's free, so please join us. Some of the notable speakers whom you may recognize are Minister Vivian, uh, Chao Ho, our Government Chief Digital Technology Officer, uh, Martin Fowler from ThoughtWorks, uh, Jean Kim, who is the author for the Phoenix Project and Unicorn Project, and Mitchell from HashiCorp, as well as AWS and Google speakers. So we have a thriving developer community here in Singapore as well as the region. Through Stack 2020, we hope to bring the community, developer community to share and learn together. Over the years, GovTech has developed a lot of products in consultation with the community such as yourselves. And the event is an opportunity for us to share some of these products and experiences with the community. So please join our StackX Telegram group chat through this QR here, and we will update uh, the chat when the registration is open. Finally, during this uh, period of COVID, we would really like to support the tech community. We have close to 400 permanent and current contract positions available. Uh, 
And whether you're a software engineer, DevOps uh, engineer, QE or CyberSec or BA, etc., you should be able to find an opening that is of interest to you. So if you know of any friends who are keen or friends who have been displaced during this difficult time, please feel free to share this with them. So next, I'd like to welcome Quexin, who leads the National Digital Identity Team here in GovTech to give an overview of the program. Quexin, please. Hello everyone. Um, I'll, I'll start with a quick introduction of myself. I'm Craig Sin. Okay, currently overseeing the uh, Singapore's National Digital Identity Program. I've been at uh, GovTech for the past 10 years. Um, I understand today we have more than 200 participants from, uh, and some of them from overseas. So uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today and uh, for your interest. Uh, I will start uh, with giving all of you a... Um, okay, let me move the slides. Uh, I'll, I'll start with giving all of you uh, some context and an overview of the NDI program. Uh, I know this is a developers meetup, so uh, I'll try to keep it short. Okay, it's getting harder as you grow older to keep things short, so uh, I'll try my best. All right. All right, so um, the concept of digital identity is not new, and as early as the late 90s, uh, many governments around the world has uh, started to implement national digital identity program. Uh, but one of the major issues with the current state of uh, digital identity is that uh, they remain fragmented uh, with insufficient identity assurance, uh, fraught with poor usability and uh, limited functionality and use cases. So uh, digital fragmentation is uh, actually the biggest threat to, threat to innovation and growth. So um, digital identity is the key to join up fragmented systems and ecosystems so that uh, we can uh, be more integrated in our services and uh, data can flow uh, with the control and the consent of data subjects. So why is, um, um, so why is um, NDI important? Many of you are Singaporeans here. You will know that Singapore's economy in the past 55 years was built on the principle of being open, trusted and interconnected. Um, and that required us to develop uh, excellent world-class infrastructure uh, to facilitate the movement of people, movement of goods, uh, movement of money. Uh, this infrastructure includes roads, ports, airports, and financial infrastructures. Uh, not only that, we also developed clear, fair, and efficient legal and regulatory frameworks that supports cross-border trust for businesses and trade. So looking forward, the questions that uh, beckons us is what are the new um, digital infrastructure that we need uh, for this increasingly digital world? All right, digitalization, if you think about it, is uh, primar primarily about trusted movement of data across systems, organizations, and borders. So uh, being an open global city, uh, we need to um, have a digital infrastructure that really facilitates such uh, trusted data movement within and outside Singapore. Uh, and that's the key reason why NDI, uh, we regard it as a strategic national project here in Singapore. So the key objectives for us is really uh, to first digitally empower our citizens by providing convenient and secure means to transact digitally uh, with more confidence, uh, be it with public or private uh, digital services. Uh, another key objective, which may not be so obvious to many of you, is actually to digitally enable government agencies and businesses by providing a series of trust services so that um, uh, this government agencies and businesses are able to digitalize their operations and uh, capture the opportunities that comes with digitalization. Uh, examples of such uh, trust services are authentication services, digital signing services, uh, and recently we also added face verification services. Uh, I will elaborate more about this uh, in later part of this presentation. Lastly, at a more macro level, as described earlier, it's really to create a ecosystem of trust so that to promote trusted data flows. Next, let me go uh, further uh, to give you a uh, a conceptual understanding of this uh, NDI digital infrastructure that we are building. Uh, this pyramid here illustrates the Singapore NDI stack. Uh, at the foundational layer, we believe that uh, it is necessary to have a trusted data ecosystem. Uh, we launched our data platform called MyInfo uh, a few years ago. Uh, this data ecosystem is a federation of centralized authoritative data sources. 
Uh, its primary purpose is to allow citizens to assess uh, information across different government agencies uh, so that they do not have to repeatedly uh, provide the same information or submit the same documents as they transact with different uh, uh, government agencies. And uh, furthermore, it gives us, uh, gives, gives the citizens uh, the control to share that information also with private sector services. Uh, uh, central to this data ecosystem is that any data sharing is uh, based on uh, explicit consent. Uh, my info so far has been uh, very well received uh, by citizens and businesses. Uh, businesses benefit because they are able to simplify their onboarding journeys and have access to authoritative data. Uh, this allows them to do remote KYC and offer instant presenceless and uh, fully digital services which uh, improve customer satisfaction, uh, increase the customer conversion rates, uh, drives up revenue and also help them lower cost. Um, citizens benefit through uh, better uh, and more convenient and cheaper services. The chart on the right, some of you may have seen it before, uh, shows uh, research done by Peter Ramsey, a founder of a US company uh, called Built for Mars, uh, who sets out to discover how easy it is to open a bank account in uh, UK and whether there is uh, indeed a difference between traditional banks and challenger banks. Um, the Center of Finance, Technology and Entrepreneurship uh, later adapted it uh, to add on uh, local banks and fintechs. As you can see from the chart, the three Singapore banks are among the top five in terms of number of clicks uh, to, to, to open a bank account. And all top five, uh, including two others, Utrip and Revolut, uh, have something in common, okay, and that is they all use my info. Uh, sure, the number of clicks does not uh, necessarily equate good user experience, but uh, user experience cannot be great if I have to click through 50 times or more. Um, so another chart which I didn't show uh, that also come from Peter Ramsey uh, shows that it takes 2 to 36 days to open a bank account in the UK. And for the three local banks, uh, bank account opening using my info is actually instantaneous. So pardon me for indulging in the chart a bit uh, too much. Okay, let's continue coming up the uh, pyramid. Uh, uh, in order to enable a consent-driven data ecosystem, we need to have an identity scheme that is of very high identity assurance. Uh, Singapore, like many European countries, uh, we are all issued a physical identity card at birth. Uh, our, national, our digital identity builds on this foundational identity. Our biometrics as a service platform also leverage on the biometrics data that is collected as part of the foundational identity. Uh, while our digital identity is largely centralized model, uh, but we believe that um, in the future, um, uh, especially if we uh, uh, want to interoperate with other identity systems around the world, we are in the process of also exploring uh, complementary, uh, this decentralized distributed models as well. Coupled with high identity assurance, we need high authentication assurance. At this layer, uh, we intend to provide a multi-form factor authentication service to both uh, public and private sector agents, uh, uh, agencies and uh, businesses. Uh, one of the form factor we, are, we have introduced is um, uh, Simpass Mobile, a crypto soft token mobile identity. And another one that we recently introduced is space verification service. Uh, while we have started with a single government-owned authentication uh, node, we intend to extend this into a federal model, federated model in the future. All right, the final layer of the NDI stack is the trusted service stack, where we expose the trust services that we provide through APIs. Um, Relying parties like public agencies and uh, private sector businesses can easily onboard and uh, integrate to our uh, platform. Uh, in order for relying parties such as uh, uh, to uh, rely parties to leverage on the trust services provided by us, uh, we have created six API products. Okay. These are uh, my info APIs for access to both individual and corporate data during onboarding and customer acquisition. Uh, Lock-in APIs, which allows relying parties to use us as an authentication service provider. Uh, Lock-in was launched uh, in July uh, last year as a pilot and went into general re release earlier this year. Uh, to date, we have more than 50 organizations uh, leveraging on us. 
Uh, Verify API is for, is for customer verification in a physical setting, very similar to safe entry. I believe all of you have used it. Uh, it is also in a general release stage. Um, authorized APIs um, allows businesses to obtain authorization from their customers remotely. For example, your insurance company can send a remote authorization request uh, through SyncPass mobile and customers can sign uh, and authorize the renewal of a policy okay, uh, remotely. All right. Authorized will be launched uh, as a pilot uh, in early next year. Sign APIs, which uh, allow relying parties and commercial document management products such as um, uh, DocuSign uh, to, to leverage on NDI for digital signing. We'll be launching the pilot uh, uh, for, for sign uh, by end of this year. All right, Identiface APIs allows the relying parties to use our face verification as a service without needing to build their own face verification system. So there's no need to enroll customers and uh, avoid, uh, and they avoid carrying the burden of collecting, storing, and securing biometric data of individuals. Uh, we launched this after the COVID circuit breaker uh, period as a pilot for CPF, IRS, and PA uh, service centers. And in July, uh, DBS also uh, used this to onboard uh, customers onto their mobile uh, applications. Uh, this has been very successful so far and we intend to go into general release uh, early next year. We are also very uh, we are very satisfied with the initial success that we had um, in business adoption of our NDI platform. Uh, we have more than 600 public and private sector digital services um, that is relying on us. Uh, but we know that we are nowhere near the full potential. Our next step, stage is really uh, focused on scaling. Uh, in multi multiple areas such as uh, more data connectivity, uh, adoption of uh, relying services, more uh, use cases. Yeah. All right, we welcome partners who are keen to integrate with us, uh, pro uh, uh, integrate their services, products, or platforms with us. Um, and this is our partners and developers portal, uh, which will give you more information if you are interested. Uh, later today, we have um, Eric. Uh, who will be giving you a short tour of this portal. Um, so far, I've highlighted the API services that we are providing to businesses. However, as a multi-site platform, uh, it is also important to ensure that our citizens are in adopting our digital identity called SingPass, which many of you should be familiar with. Um, we have also introduced the mobile digital identity called SingPass Mobile uh, that, has, uh, that we started issuing about one and a half years ago. Uh, today, we have uh, more than 2 million users on SingPass Mobile with more than uh, 1.2 million uh, monthly active users. Uh, we also introduced a national check-in uh, system called Safe Entry, which extends from our digital identity platform to allow more than 2 million users to check into more than 200,000 venues on a daily basis. Uh, our ability to launch Safe Entry nationwide uh, within a few weeks was made possible by leveraging on uh, digital identity infrastructure that has already been built. So where do we go from here? Uh, I started this presentation saying that NDI is important not only within Singapore but it serves as a way for us to uh, connect digitally beyond uh, our borders. Uh, just like how our passports allow us to enter the borders of other countries, uh, could it happen one day that we can use SingPass uh, to assess services overseas? Uh, could it happen that we can interoperate our digital identities with other countries so that foreigners are able to access services provided by Singaporeans and Singapore companies using their digital identity? Uh, the future of digital identity can uh, actually be quite easily visualized uh, by looking at the credit card networks that now exist. Um, the digital identity issuers are like card issuers today. Okay. Uh, we also need merchant acquirers to ensure that digital services can validate and accept these digital identities. And, uh, uh, and uh, what we need to do is really to come together to build common trust frameworks, including legal, liability, and commercial frameworks, uh, so that we can move this uh, forward. All right, so um, I've come to the end of uh, this presentation. I will hand over uh, to the next presenter, which is a uh, trio of presenters, Donald, Nixon, and Wongso. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Greg Singh. A uh, very good evening to everyone. My name is Donald, Solution Architect in NDI Project. Together with Dixon and Wongso, we will give you a brief on the NDI tech stack.
Let me start by highlighting the six areas of engineering focus for our MDI platform and the challenge statement for each. First, multi-tenancy. How do we avoid duplicated efforts spent on common patterns across all NDI projects? Second, resiliency. How do we ensure our NDI services is always available, knowing that all systems will fail one time or another? Third, security. NDI as one of the first critical infrastructure to be built on cloud. How would the security paradigm change? How do we design security knowing that it is going to be a shared responsible model? Availability. Besides avoiding unscheduled downtime, how do we minimize the scheduled downtime and ensure services were still able to work during deployment? Next, repeatability. How do we ensure consistency of all environment across all of our deployment? Lastly, visibility. How do we build metrics, insights to foresee and manage our system better when things go wrong before it impact our customer? And yeah, as, a, as a program today, consists of multiple projects. SingPass, SingPass Mobile, MyInfo, Digital Signing, Face Verification, and so on. In every project we came across, we observed common patterns in the infrastructure. Every web app project would require some form of DMZ to control traffic in and out of the network. A management zone consisting a suite of tools for monitoring, logging, access, management, etc. The question here is, how do we implement this efficiently to the cloud, avoiding duplicated effort in building the common pattern in the infrastructure and enforce consistency in policy standards alignment? Today, NDS services are deployed in the cloud, leveraging on GCC platform, which enforce uniformity on how we onboard users, define the roles, access rights, and so on across the three cloud providers. NDI also leverage on SG tech stack, such as the CI-CD pipeline for our developers. Just as NDI is a tenant in GCC, we also need to create a multi-tenancy architecture in the form of common stacks shown in the black boxes on the screen, which can be shared by the different projects. This, of course, is an abstract view. There are more complexity than what is shown here. This helps to eliminate the need for app developers to build infra so that they can focus on actual application development works. Beside the DMZ and management zone, there are also deployment pipeline and AIAS zone. So what is AIAS zone? The AIAS zone serves as a bridge to enable protected traffic flow between the internet and internet zone through encryption, authentication, and payload inspection. While building a common stack have obvious benefit, there are also trade-offs we need to address, which is the concentration risk. For example, our design need to address isolation of project configuration and workload instances. Project by project, we need the shared infra components so that when there's an issue, like a configuration changes or the program bugs in one project, it will not result cascading failure to other projects. Common stack. X helps to set up a common pattern in infra, promote reusability across all NDI projects. In every project development, there's this tendency to spend efforts on their own infra needs. Possible reason could be driven by timeline, bothered by contract, lack of multi-tenancy in other projects, so you can't really reuse it, or product limitation. If you look at the table highlighted in red, these are illustration of effort and expenses we can save by just building it once for all projects to share and consume. And to bring everyone in depth into another problem, our app development won't be efficient either. Without a common stack, every project will have their own interpretation on how to align their own implementation to the policy. Repeated set of security assessment, like your threat risk assessment, your cyber security design review, your VAP test, read team exercise, on the infrastructure will be doing again and again for each project. In time to come, it will be just in a mess. Therefore, NDI common stacks define a set of frameworks, a standards that's referencing back to the industry best practices and the implementation guides for all NDI projects to use, ensuring alignment with our security policies. 
In this way, we hope to bring out the best efficiency in each of our app development team. We all know that even the cloud service provider today do encounter outages. It is unrealistic to expect a system will never fail. We are better off assuming that all systems will actually fail. As a nation platform that serves 4 million plus users and thousands of public and private sector companies, how can we build a platform that is more resilient to the failure outages? First and foremost, we fully leverage the multi availability zone, which you see here screen, okay, the trade availability zone, network capability of the cloud platform to build an active, active system across the three EZ in Singapore region. Traffic is load balanced across the three EZ. Second, we implement auto scaling group in every node in the transactional path. Besides providing the on-demand capacity to respond to suddenness in the load, the auto scaling group created for each node also eliminate any single point of failure. What do I mean? Assuming that today there's 100 requests sent to AZ1 on the left box, and suddenly in between one of the reverse proxies suddenly fail. In a, tradi in a traditional setup, all the, all the requests will time out and just fail. But in our setup, the auto scaling group of the reverse proxy will just route the request to the next availability zone, right? And still process the remaining requests successfully. We also implement auto healing. One of our key selection criteria of product to use in our platform is it must be stateless. And the support for health check, this enables the product to work with the cloud auto scaling mechanism where the auto scaling group can detect a malfunction instance and replace the instance automatically. And there is a CII and security of the system is paramount. It is important that we do not just carry over the traditional security paradigm that exists in our on-prem system today, but look at how we can implement a security paradigm in a cloud that is equivalent or better. We take reference from the zero trust framework, which is no longer a marketing term, but implementable patterns published by NIST. So what is your trust to NDI? Micro segmentation is a mechanism to reduce blast radius of an infra component when security is compromised. In our segmentation, we deploy each set of infra component in their own subnets. And when security is compromised, the blast radius is kept beneath the subnet. And to achieve the effectiveness of the micro segmentation, fine grained access control are put in place to ensure the each set of infra component only can communicate with its intended workload. We follow this rule at the time. Never trust, always verify across workload implemented NDI. Later, I share more how this works. This is a simple logical diagram of a system initiating a request to enterprise resource. Enterprise resource could be another system, database or the cloud resource. When a system initiate a request, it is considered untrusted until verification is done. The verification are conducted in the PEP process. And that is where policy at the decision point are validated and checked. To give you all a flavor, what do I mean in terms of the actual scenario? Just give a scenario on the right. Imagine a scenario of an instant to instance or a docker to docker communication. Right? The verification process could be split into three layers. For network policy layer, it has to ensure the system is coming from internal workload to communicate with in the first place. That's where the subnet firewall, the host firewall, the routing rule set, the MTLS come into the picture. This is to ensure the system is not impersonated. And next, for system policy layer, the request has to go through authentication, authorization, and payload inspection to mitigate against malform related attacks. And, it, and if this request is going to communicate with a cloud resource, that's where IAM policy comes to the picture. It will validate the roles and the access rights you have before, it, before the action can be executed. And for this zero trust to work out holistically in NDI, the backbone system has to be very important. For example, your access management, 
every system will need to have an ID assigned or a PKI, a certificate that's issued, there must be a way to revoke it once it's compromised. And of course, every assignment of the, of the ID to the system, there must be a data access policy to determine which data they can access to. For governance, the technical security standard used will reference industry best practices. For feeds, we will gather threat intelligence feeds from trusted third party sources to guard against. And for threat detection alerts and response, that is where all the activity logs will be piped into the SIEM and where the SIEM will correlate to detect threats. If there's, and today, there's, if ever there's threat, it will send out the alert and that's where our security response team will be on it. Last and not least, we are not saying that we're going to throw away the decades of experience that we have in perimeter defense, right? But in combination of it for a better security posture in NDI in the cloud. In a very simple uh, snapshot of, this, of some of the key security modules that we have, so on the top is whatever security module we use for AWS to guard against DDoS attack, threat detection, activity logging of all the cloud resources, compliance check, IAM rules, privacy to issue certificate the HSM, which is FIPS level three. On top of that, NDA also introduced our own set of controls. For example, like firewall to guard against network threats, like reverse API gateway to guard against layer seven attacks, fault proxy to mitigate against data exfiltration risk. And then is to ensure it's, it's a database activity monitoring to ensure that today the application is sending the intended SQL statement to the database and not more. AD and PAM is used for privilege access management as part of the remote management into our system. Approval and consent has to be obtained before anyone can access into our system. EPP as an endpoint protection together with the endpoint detection and response, this work together to detect virus, malware, and send alerts back to our SIEM. Vulnerability management system is, is, is playing a role to scan all, all our running workload for any vulnerabilities and any compliance mismatch. And of course, just now I will also talk about SIEM. Traditionally, availability is measured by the total uptime of the service minus unplanned downtime. But we often forget that scheduled downtime is also considered a downtime to the service as well. So how should we avoid it? NDI today uses a combination of approaches to achieve a zero downtime deployment, be it a rolling update, blue-green deployment, or canary deployment. It really depends how disruptive will the deployment be. As a prerequisite for NDI, all our, infra all our infrastructure setup driven, are driven by infra as a code, which is the IEC automation is built into the CI-CD pipeline to test deployment across all environments before we pull the trigger to deploy to the production environment, which is what you see on the screen on the right. Blue zone indicated here, which is in the blue-green, which is on the blue side, here is the existing running workload, which is running the old version. We depend on the use of AWS ROC53, a cloud-native control with 100% SLA, this is where we map the external FQDN, which is here, to the internal facing FQDN, which is, which, is, which is given to the blue and green zone. We then use IAC to spin up the green zone, which is on the right, through the CI-CD pipeline and wait till the new release are deployed into it. Sanity checks are done as well. And here is our version two. Once this is done, we'll initiate an IAC script to sort the internal FQDN mapping from the, green, from the blue zone to the green zone. This will redirect the traffic from the blue to the green. In the event if things goes wrong in the green zone, we just have to swap it back. And our operation team will go back to look into it, the errors that are behind the scene while the service still continues to run smoothly. Although this diagram looks very simple, it is certainly not. It is important to always check if the communicating endpoint which is coming from the top right, for the user has been redirected to the green zone because some of the runtime libraries of the application actually catch the IP address of the previous resolved FQDN. So it may take some time to redirect, to be redirected to the green zone FQDN. Yeah. Next. 
let me pass my mic to Dixon to present the next topic. Okay, uh, thanks Donald. Uh, the next engineering focus will be repeatability. Repeatability can be seen as a series of events caused by human errors, misconfiguration, or lack of test coverage. We can also approach this from a different perspective to see how repeatability has enabled us to build a continuous set of practices to minimize the risk of issues and failures to deliver a robust infrastructure through an automated, secure, and efficient process. Next, please. Next. When it comes to infrastructure, some of you might have encountered these problems in your career or heard stories about it. First, you have configuration drift, where you started with identical servers, but over time, changes have made them up with different configurations. The best part, you don't know what is different between them. Which brings us right next to the, to the next point, where people become afraid to make changes, knowing that the slightest change could break the environment. And by having more manual processes involving people, the more vulnerable it is to human errors, as changes are easily lost in transition, as they end up uh, being harder to track or trace. This affects the time that you are supposed to be spending to get your products out of the market, instead of having to troubleshoot what has gone wrong. And to sum it all, because of all the endless possibilities of things that could happen, we decided that it was best that we bring this offline to roll changes or troubleshoot issues. Next. Let's take a look at how NDI looks to IEC as a method to help us eliminate those issues through the use of source code. Using IEC has many benefits. All actions that can be automated will be automated, and we have to start trading hardware as if they are software, which means we can write code to configure and deploy infrastructure components quickly and consistently. This ensures that our deployment process can be automated will be repeatable, predictable, and error-free. As everything is captured in code, we can repeatedly build multiple identical environments from the same code base. We can deploy automated tests to test for incremental change and check for errors before ensuring the changes will be applied reliably and safely. With the right process built around IAC, risk of issues or failures can be minimized which give us the confidence to make changes without fear. Next, let's take a look at NDI's approach to IAC. The diagram on the right is made up of four distinct levels. And the first level represents our base infra components. This forms the common baseline that was designed to be shareable across NDI projects to greatly speed up and simplify infrastructure deployment. This reduces the time, money, and effort required for each team to develop and maintain their own infra components. Next. In the second level, we have our stacks. Stacks are an assembly of building blocks derived from the first level and composed as deployable infrastructure. Next. In the third level, we have the app infra, which represents applications deployed as containers into Kubernetes to support NDI applications. Next. Last but not least, we have the fourth level, which holds our NDI applications as containers in Kubernetes. The benefits of separating them into different levels is that they can be incorporated into different stages of the deployment pipeline. And each of these levels can be assigned to different teams. Next. For the first level, Referring to the diagram on the right, we have chosen Terraform to provide us with a consistent workflow in building up a service catalog of secure and trusted modules. Terraform does not care how you structure your code. It is not going to detect a similar set of code and tell you this is not a good practice. We are sharing this with you because we want you to start off from the right track to avoid the mistakes and having to go back to clean up your infrastructure after it has reached a certain stage of maturity. This is a painful process. For NDI, we did not want every team to start creating their own modules with different code styles and standards. So we have this first level as our central repository for teams to pull modules, contribute, and reuse it. It is through a collective effort 
we can ensure quality, consistency, and repeatability is built into a single source of truth, which helps accelerate teams to as assemble a new project from these prefabricated building blocks. First, we identify the resources for our infrastructure. Then, we use Terraform to build them into generic, reusable building blocks, known as modules. We ensure each of these modules are thoroughly tested and documented before they are versioned and released as an immutable artifact, ready to be promoted through environments. If you notice, each module was designed to be as small as possible, to the extent that we treat it as a single unit of resource, so that we can test it efficiently. With modules, you can also enforce organization or project requirements, such as defining your naming conventions or having default tags automatically applied to AWS resources. While Terraform can be a game changer to provide an organized way of managing and sharing your resources, you can quickly run into the mess when done incorrectly. Next. Let's take a look at the diagram below. We are also using a tool called Packer to efficiently manage the building of machine images with security and compliance in mind. This ensures that OS are patched and hardened according to CIS guidelines, which becomes the golden standard for our images. We have built-in tests for these images before we tag these images safe to use and readily share this across NDI projects. For security, we also pre-bake our agents for CloudWatch, EPP, EDR into our images. Once these images are rolled out, we continuously monitor them for vulnerabilities and rebuild the images when required. Next. This is the level where different teams will come into the picture and use Terraform to assemble their own stacks using modules from the first level to create their own infrastructure. However, there is always a tendency for teams to skip past the first level and jump straight into building their own infrastructure. And this often leads to code that is not reusable by other teams. Precious time and effort will be required to fix this, and in complicated scenarios, some of this infrastructure will have to be created. And to avoid this from occurring, it is important to enforce the repeated use of modules from the first level to help build up your stacks. Referring to the diagram on the right, to better help NDI facilitate the management of stacks, we assemble our stacks into different groups of BPCs. And infrastructure is treated exclusive to the underlying stack. This helps us better control and audit the changes going in and out of the stacks. Another important point for you to consider is that you always have to plan ahead for your directory structure and file layout early in your development lifecycle. Next. Uh, next, yeah. App Infra is the level defined in Kubernetes where we install applications to introduce security, observability, and resiliency into the cluster. As you know, the more objects we deploy into Kubernetes, the more complex it becomes to manage the lifecycle of these objects and to continuously track them for upgrades. We have chosen Helm as the package manager to help us use Kubernetes more efficiently. Working with Helm provides a consistent workflow to quickly define, cleanly manage, and easily deploy applications. It helps to package everything into one simple application and advertise what is configurable. This makes application deployment easy, standardized, and reusable, which improves overall developer productivity and reduces deployment complexity. Next. Next, apps and configs is the level where we install NDI applications into Kubernetes. These apps were designed to be stateless and are responsible for serving application traffic. Once again, we are using Helm to efficiently manage the deployment for these applications and to further ensure that they are configured with security and resiliency in mind. Uh, that is all. Uh, next, I will be handing over to Wong So. Um, thank you, Dixon. 
Okay, we all heard of a different story about system failure, right? Um, many fail, uh, mining system fail not because of one small thing break typically, but because there are multiple small things breaks and uh, adds up into one bigger issue, um, then the system collapse. And this is why it is very important for us to have, to gain a better full visibility into different part of our system and be able to detect anomalies early. Okay, uh, I'll be sharing uh, what we have implemented and uh, practices we put in place to improve our monitoring capabilities. So if we have seen here, uh, uh, and the component and services that shared by Donald earlier in NDI stack. Uh, the question is, how do we know that each component is healthy? How do we track our service reliability? Uh, for this, we have put in place a monitoring stack, uh, which is a shared monitoring service for multiple NDI products. Uh, we have collected hundreds of uh, metrics from different component, infra, application, um, AWS services, and all metrics are presented to a dashboard that allow ops teams to perform analysis, uh, spot certain usage pattern, and potentially detect anomaly, and of course, uh, implement preventive measure when required. Um, we all also collected um, a lot of uh, system lock, application lock, and security event. They are all piped into a central logging uh, service. Having a centralized logging uh, service allow us to analyze and access the logs easily during troubleshooting and uh, able to correlate when there are issues involving multiple products. With all these metrics and uh, log collected, uh, we put in place a set of uh, actionable alerts so that we can act on it fast and in some cases provide an early warning task reducing uh, mean time to recovery. Typically, upon receiving uh, all this alert, the ops team will be able to click on the alert and they will be able to uh, be directed to a specific monitoring dashboard for further investigation. And for some critical event, and an incident ticket will be automatically created uh, for the ops team. Uh, beside all the technology stack that we have implemented, we also define a set of practices so that we can achieve our desired uh, reliability. Uh, next please, Donald. Uh, here we take a different approach, uh, which, uh, which is to focus on the health and uptime of the, uh, each service that we have in NDI, uh, which is a reflection of uh, what the users experience actually. So it is basically a user perceived uptime. Uh, we started this uh, by identifying how the user interact with the system. For example, during authentication, user will scan QR, then user will then be prompted to give a consent. Once the authentication request is signed, it will be verified by the authentication service provider and certificate authority. So all these touch points and steps are mapped into a service journey and possibly multiple sub journeys. It means identifying relevant endpoint and all critical service dependency involved within the user interaction. This, is a, this dependency could be a database, message queue, cache, uh, or other AWS services. Once the service journey is identified, we then define the SLI and SLO for each of the service journey. We then translate it into monitoring dashboard and alerts. Uh, of course, this is not a one-time process, uh, not one-time activity. Uh, after the baseline is set, we continuously monitor and fine-tune uh, alert and SLO. We continuously review our process and identify opportunity for opportuni uh, automation. For example, uh, CloudWatch alert will be updated when instance is created. So we have uh, Lambda that run periodically to scan the environment and refresh the uh, alert setting. We, when possible, we automate, our, for example, our Grafana dashboard verification before deployment um, by creating a Python script and uh, as I mentioned earlier, instead of manually creating incident ticket, uh, we automate incident ticket creation for critical event. It is also our practice to validate and test um, our reliability, uh, our service reliability periodically. In fact, um, we had a game day yesterday uh, where two teams, uh, one team uh, will trigger failure to the system, 
and the, uh, another team tried to resolve the incident. It was a good exercise and we can verify our service reliability. We can verify the effectiveness of our monitoring and alert system. We can observe uh, what alerts get triggered and when the what, how the error get uh, reflected in our dashboard. This exercise is definitely a good way to identify gaps in our monitoring alert as well as the uh, ops process. So next I will focus on uh, the first two practices. Uh, we started with a simple concept, which is uh, breaking down the service journey into two layers. Okay, each, each layer will uh, address uh, different concern actually. So at level one, uh, le layer one, the ops teams will have a bird eye view of uh, all the services uh, in the, that related to the specific NDI product. At this level, ops will, team will be able to quickly spot uh, which service is having issue. Uh, if there's a critical component that we depend on, uh, it will get reflected immediately at this level one uh, uh, dashboard view. Okay, um, and then once once the issue is identified, the ops team can, can drill into level two, which is uh, providing a detailed view of the relevant service endpoint, uh, ports health, related metrics, and, the, the, and all the dependency. Here, ops teams will be able to see component that causing the issue, then continue to do in-depth troubleshooting by looking at logs from specific components. Next, we'll look into uh, defining SLI and SLO. Uh, we have various teams working together to, to define the SLI and SLO from infra, application, and ops teams. So in this example here, uh, we have, uh, let's say we have a QR authentication service that's accessible via SingPass Mobile. We then define a specific SLI, SLI that we want to uh, track. Uh, in this case, uh, latency, for example of the QR authentication and it has to be completed within certain seconds. And then from there we decide uh, how are we going to measure it uh, and what are the each of the endpoints that involve within uh, this service journey itself. And we need to track the amount of time required to complete each of these uh, activities. Um, after that then we baseline our SLO. Um, for example, here we have 99% of the authentication must be complete within five seconds. Okay, this is just an example. Uh, we then translate and develop a uh, monitoring dashboard to track this uh, SLI and SLO over, the time, over a period of time. And uh, again, we continuously monitoring this uh, alert and threshold that we define and refine all our baseline uh, and SLO uh, regularly. Finally, I'll share uh, one or two screenshots of how we translate our uh, earlier dashboard in our earlier concept into Grafana dashboard. Uh, next, please, Tono. Okay, in this uh, first level view, uh, this level, first level view is intended for the ops teams to or operator to immediately uh, look at uh, everything that is related to specific NDI product. Uh, if you can see from the top, you can see all the critical infrastructures that's managed by NDI team um, and then followed by AWS services that we consume. And of course, at the bottom here, you can see uh, those are the service journey that uh, we have identified and each of the service journey will have a different sub journey. Um, all these metrics, uh, basically uh, calculated and aggregated uh, based on various uh, metrics that it depends on. For example, each service journey depends on the health of the port, uh, depend on, let's say, a database metrics, depend on the error rate within that service journey. So all this will be aggregated as uh, in a single view. So if an error, um, let's say, detected and, and uh, alert is triggered, what the ops teams can do is actually click on uh, the link to the sub journey and then it will, they will be directed to level two. Uh, next one. In the level two, uh, the ops team will be able to look at the detail of sub journey and the dependency related to each sub journey. Here we display, for example, port health, external communication, 
uh, health itself. For example, if uh, one of our product is making call to uh, another system like certificate authority, we will be able to track the health of that communication itself. And then uh, other relevant uh, metrics that is important to this service journey. For example, request rate, error rate, latency, and uptime. Uh, next one, please. Uh, the ops team can then view each component, uh, uh, which is uh, broken into more detail, uh, such as the, for example, if I have the connection, DB connection drop to zero, the ops team can immediately take action and perform further investigation. So what we have here is uh, not the end of the monitoring stack implementation. Uh, monitoring to us is a journey and we continuously enhance our monitoring uh, stack as, as the business requirement change and technology evolves. So uh, with that, uh, I end our presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you also. Uh, thank you, Greg Sin and uh, Solution Architect Group for the, the presentations. So before we start with the short Q&A, uh, if you have joined late, National Dig uh, NDI stands for National Digital Identity. And someone else also asked what SLI and SLO stands for. Uh, it stands for Service Level Indicator and Service Level Objective uh, that Wong So just uh, shared. So my first question uh, now will direct to Greg Sin. You mentioned uh, briefly in your presentation about facial recognition services. I'm sure many of us has read it in the news. So will you be able to share a bit more about what it's about? Okay, um, yeah. Um, it's very hard to share over here because it would take uh, very long, okay? And uh, what I'll suggest is that uh, we are intending to share this in the uh, main stack event, okay, in December. All right, so a little bit of teaser. So if you are interested, uh, please join the stack uh, event in December. Okay. Thank you, Craig Sim, for the call. Uh, shout out. So uh, please join our Telegram group. We'll be sharing uh, when the registration for stack 2020 is open. So next question also to Craig Sim, uh, from the Q&A panel. Uh, could you articulate on the future and ambition of NDI a bit uh, out in the further 10 year horizon? And uh, like, how do we achieve higher adoption for Singaporeans and residents? Right. Um, okay, so this is like forcing me to look into a crystal ball uh, into the, uh, 10 years later. Um, I'll, I'll try. All right. So uh, may not happen, all right? but uh, this is what I think. Uh, just now I used the example of credit card uh, ecosystem. And uh, I think really digital identity would eventually be like a credit card eco ecosystem. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, today uh, you are being issued a credit card by any banks. Okay, they're called uh, card issuers. All right, and you can uh, use this credit card anywhere with any merchants, all right, around the world. Okay, um, uh, despite that, um, the card issuer and the merchant acquirer, okay, who is the merchant's bank, uh, are different banks. All right, so if you if you take that into um, and, and and look at it in the, in the light of digital identity, this means that every country uh, would. Uh, be able to issue their citizens uh, digital identity, okay, uh, can be in any form, okay, could be mobile or could be card, all right, and then uh, the idea here is that um, we can use this digital identity that's being issued, okay, by uh, the authority or authority of the um, appointed um, service provider, all right, using this digital identity anywhere in the world uh, to prove your identity. All right. So an example that uh, we talked about is, for example, if you are uh, working overseas, all right, uh, and um, the first thing when you work overseas, okay, is that you need to apply for visa, all right. Uh, later on, you need to uh, um, open a bank account, okay. Uh, all this requires you to prove your identity. And today, what do we do when we are overseas, okay? We have to bring along all our documentations, all right, and be able to uh, get it notarized, okay, and then submit it. Uh, to the banks or to the authorities, right? So what we are uh, looking at is that uh, when digital identity are interoperable, okay, this means that uh, I can just um, uh, lock in with SingPass, for example, if I'm working, let's say going to UK to work, all right? Uh, I, I uh, use a part of the visa service that uh, UK um, uh, uh, government has for me to apply for visa, 
All right? On that service, I can I, I can say that okay, I want to use SyncPass to prove my identity and uh, uh, consent the necessary data. All right, to be passed over to the authority in UK. All right, so this really streamlined okay the transactions okay that uh, we do day to day and uh, not only within Singapore but uh, across the world. Uh, the other the trend we look at is that uh, there are certain countries today that still do not have a uh, identity system. All right, uh, most mainland Europe countries have. All right, and uh, Singapore of course have. All right, uh, but countries like Australia, uh, UK, uh, US uh, do not have a, a central uh, federal kind of identity system. All right, uh, and and so there is this movement towards a distrib distributed uh, identity system. All right, so I think that uh, in the next couple of years we'll see uh, more and more of that. Okay, and it is important for Singapore to be able to interoperate with uh, both centralized identity systems as well as um, a distributed identity system. So uh, that's why we earlier uh, mentioned that uh, we are also exploring uh, a complementary uh, kind of a system. All right, to uh, make sure that uh, we are ready to connect okay when the rest of the world are ready i'll take a related question okay uh, someone asked me about the state of interoperability especially with estonia all right um this is uh, really a still a very nascent okay uh, thing around the world uh, to, to be honest many countries are still struggling with their national identity um, so uh, so the focus is really to set that up first all right but uh, Singapore has already established a couple of uh, cross-border digital digital uh, economy agreement. Okay, and within those uh, DEAs, all right, uh, 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 MOUs. Okay, with different countries. Okay, to look at how we can uh, start some pilots. Okay, uh, to ex to demonstrate the interoperability of I uh, identity. So we are already in uh, talks. Okay, with a couple of countries. Uh, to do that, not with Estonia, we want to start with countries where we have uh, lots of um, exchange, okay, exchange of people, exchange of uh, trade, all right, and then the use case will be more uh, useful, all right. With Estonia, okay, we are friendly to Estonia, but uh, I, I think there is quite limited uh, people and trade flows between uh, both countries, so maybe it's not a, a very uh, 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 good place to start, yeah. Okay. Um, Thank. Yep. Should I take other questions or? Sure. Sure. Uh, if not, there's one on key engineering and technical challenges for NDI. Okay. Um, like what um, uh, Dono and team has uh, highlighted, okay, the six areas are actually the key uh, challenges and areas that we are uh, looking at. All right. Um, I I won't say one is more important than than the other. All right. Uh, they are all important. They all contribute to the resiliency of the systems, the security of the systems, uh, and the agility of the system. So uh, all these are uh, very important. The 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 NDI uh, project allows us a chance to really rethink how we architect our system. All right. To uh, really deliver uh, the expectation. Uh, of a national digital platform like uh, NDI. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have time for other questions? Just one more, then we will need to go into Eric's segment. Okay. Uh, I just randomly choose. Huh? Okay, are the capabilities of uh, of of that we have okay all internally developed uh, within GovTech? Um, uh, we for for NDI implementation, okay, we adopted a co-sourcing model. All right, uh, so I would say uh, half of the implementation team, in, including the engineers, okay, are GovTech uh, uh, staff. All right, and uh, the other half, okay, are co-sourced uh, with uh, partners in the industry. All right, so uh, I think this is uh, uh, quite a 
common model nowadays okay that we uh, do all right and that's why uh, we have the architect office within uh, NDI and this architect office are all uh, GovTech personnel all right so that they are um, uh, on top and uh, are able to drive okay some of the design decisions okay of uh, NDI yeah all right okay, okay. Thank you, Greg Sin. Uh, next, may we please invite uh, Eric to share about the NDI Developers Portal, please. Eric, over to you. Sure, thank you, Karen. Um, can, you, can you guys hear me? All right, yes. hi, my name is Eric. Um, for the presentation, I will be focusing on an aspect that is as important as building a great product. And of course, that is documentation and support. Well, not sure about you, but every time um, you know, I attend some product launch events, the presentation is solid, the marketing brochure is picture perfect. But when I try, try to start using the product, I hit issues. Huh? All my troubleshooting attempts on the product side always ends up with the same marketing brochure, the picture perfect one, being thrown back at me. Or maybe just uh, a support email, which you know, they will take ages um, uh, to reply. Now, at GovTech, um, we're developers ourselves and understand that pain. Hence, my presentation today is to introduce you to NDI's developer and partner portal, which aims to provide the necessary resources required for developers like yourself to build POCs and carry them through to production. And as what um, Karen has mentioned previously, the site is accessible through the, the main developer portal um, with the URL www.developer.tech.gov.sg and you can follow the breadcrumbs um, that I've listed here. Alternatively, you can, the direct link to the portal is here and you can scan the QR code to get there as well. All right, the portal contains um, documentations of the products that we have G8, like uh, my info and verify, um, a series of tutorials to guide you through the integration process, um, as well as providing working sample applications that you can take off the shelf and modify it for the purpose of your POC. For business partners, the portal prov also provides an automated onboarding process to submit link up requests, and once approved, access provisioning is actually instant. Now, this is the landing page of the developer and partner portal, and that covers the overview of NDI's product offerings, as well as inspirations on how our offerings can fuel your next killer app. Now details of individual offerings can be found under the API library menu uh, at the top. On a side note, as much as it is a given nowadays, uh, I would still like to highlight that our site is responsive and it caters to browsing on the go. But for the rest of the presentation, I will be using MyInfo, which is one of our flagship product to introduce the various resources available. You get to this page by going to the API library um, and choosing my info. Now we've structured our product documentation into three parts. Overview, get started, and API specification. And today I will be placing emphasis on the step-by-step -step tutorials, the self-help resources, and finally the specifications. Firstly, the tutorials. For my info, we have three tutorials that aims to get you through the integration with our APIs from POC to production. Now, these tutorials have went through many revisions, taking in feedbacks from various channels, and has also unfortunately become part of our new team members initiation program. So if you join our team, um, you will be asked to actually run through the tutorials to make sure that you understand, and we will time you based on that um, to see how well uh, we've written that documentation. The first tutorial focused on helping you understand the structure of our API, uh, the structure uh, of the, our API responses actually. Using our sandbox API that returns uh, mock data, you can then focus on building a quick prototype for showcasing. The second tutorial introduces the OAuth authorization standard, which my info leverages on for capturing user consent in order to release users' personal data. Now this tutorial helps you to understand the changes required in the user journey so that you can weave that, in, that new flow into your POC. 
And lastly, the tutorial, the last tutorial focuses on the security aspect of our API, documenting how we have used PKI to increase our security posture. For development purposes, we do actually provide a set of PKI keys that can be used to connect to our test environment. So there's no need um, to worry about onboarding at this point in time. Uh, you can focus on the development work. And a working sample application uh, is actually integrated with our test environment using the same PKI key uh, set is publicly available for download and you can use it as a reference while you build your POC. Moving on, under the resources section, we have published many materials that you can perform self-help when you face with issues. Firstly, we publish a range of personas with different residential statuses, age group, and so on and so forth that you can actually use for positive and negative testing for your use case. Secondly, we provide an exhaustive list of error codes that may be returned by our APIs, as well as possible reasons for you to gracefully handle exceptions. Next, we provide two very useful tools to help in troubleshooting integration errors with our APIs. As mentioned earlier, we use PKI to secure our APIs, which will require you to generate base strings corresponding to the API that you're calling and perform digital signing on top of it. So when we get an unauthorized error response from our API, the problem could lie with a wrong base string generated, or you may have used a wrong key to sign. So during circumstances like this, the base string checker and signature verifier can be used hand in hand to help you identify which part of the security process that is causing the issue. Moving on to the interface specification. This is how um, our interface specs looks like. We have chosen to use Open API specification, um, previously known as Swagger, to document our APIs and render the specs using Redoc. The specification is a fully, fully self-sufficient piece of documentation containing detailed API specification request and response data format with examples, our security standards, and code snippets. Hence, if there's only one thing that you take away from my presentation, please let this be the one thing. Our APIs are also versioned, um, and we have also included a change history in the specification to capture log to capture the changes um, uh, across major, minor, and patch versions. Right, um, we are constantly trying to improve our product and the support that we provide to developers and partners. But is providing good documentation, tutorials, sample codes enough? Currently, all partners that are integrating with us will need to understand OAuth, um, PKI, digital signature, even if their bread and butter is not in IT. Um, I was actually being challenged by my bosses, I will not say their names, um, that, Eric, you're teaching people to fish, but why are you teaching non-fishermen to fish if they can concentrate on what they do best and then buy the fish from the supermarket? And that challenge actually gave birth to my info integration connectors. That, will be, that, that we will be making publicly available soon. All right? The connectors is actually currently uh, available in Node.js, uh, Java, and .NET. So if you are implementing um, your system on any of these languages, you can simply download and use it as a library in your code base. With just a few configuration parameters, integrating with MyInfo can just be as simple as a method call instead of understanding all the technology behind it. With this, I urge all of you to subscribe to our mailing list um, that is published on our developer and partner portal uh, to stay in touch and be notified of more exciting developments in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric, for sharing. Uh, just a quick question for the NDI uh, developer portal. Can we use it for onboarding some of your services? Yes, so all the different services that we have G8, uh, for those that, um, you know, uh, that we're GA, you can actually go through the portal. Um, you just need a login call pass, um, and then um, we will provide the process for to onboard you uh, automatically. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, okay, now we'll uh, lead into the combined Q and A segment. Uh, 
Okay, and second, let me bring up a few questions uh, for the team to answer. So Brandon has a question. Uh, if there are any plans for us to uh, view the history of who, who and what had been requested for access to our data and what consent has been given or revoked. Uh, if we could ask uh, Eric, uh, who should answer the question? All right, uh, I think I can take the <laughs> question. Okay. All right, um, currently my info actually provides a, a, a sort of like a, a, a transaction history of who has requested for your data and that is actually available via our uh, my info user portal all right but very soon we will also make the same uh, history available uh, via simpass mobile for convenience okay thank you Eric. Uh, next we'll take andy's question uh, if we could ask wing kyung to take this using the blue and gray deploy concept to increase availability. How do you deal with data with the new version uh, introductions and requirements uh, in change in data schema and yet both blue and green can coexist during the transition? Thank you, please. Hi, uh, okay, this, this is a, uh, indeed a very good question and uh, a very tough one as well. Uh, so, um, so we, um, uh, we are actually looking at it, right? Um, and um, uh, at this point of time, uh, we believe blue green can actually um, uh, help to do that, help to serve that. Uh, but uh, you know, it uh, it does uh, involve a bit of uh, uh, you know uh, a lot of the so-called coordination between uh, between application and and also the you know the database side of things, right? So if if you are talking about, uh, for example, a deep a database schema change. So the change is not just at a, at a database. The change is also at the uh, you know the business logic at the application side as well. So, so so we are actually going to be actually um, you know deploying uh, changes to the application as well as uh, you know dealing with uh, a database change right at a schema level. Um, and um, you know the uh, AWS will will definitely tell you that uh, you know you know there's no problem right doing this. You know there's. <laughs> You can just do it, right? Um, yeah, but uh, you know, if you if you have millions of data already inside your database, right? You probably you, you probably want to be a bit more prudent about it. So uh, so this is what we will uh, you know this is probably uh, something that we we, uh, we we have to do, right? Um, so so we will have to blue green the database as well, uh, meaning uh, you know uh, um, you know as we spin out the. Um, the, the green database, uh, the green, uh, you know, the green um, uh, part of the uh, uh, infra, we have to actually, um, you know, spin up the database and uh, and at the same time uh, perform uh, data replication, right, from the, you know, from the blue database to the green database. And then at one point, uh, we have to actually, um, you know, uh, uh, so-called switch the, gr the green database to the blue one, right, meaning, uh, you know, now, um, you know the updates were actually going to be happening at the the new database, the blue one, and at the same time we have to also switch the traffic uh, over to the green um, the green side of things. Where, you know where we deploy the new application. So, um, so um, you know as as you as you can see, uh, there there will be a definite there will be a you know a momentary kind of a, uh, you know outage right when transactions has to be switched over when we have to stop the the data replication. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I believe we can keep it down. Right? Keep it down to um, you know um, to to seconds and minutes. So um, yeah, so I think uh, this is uh, uh, something that I believe uh, uh, is achievable, um, and uh, we hope uh, you know we hope not to do it right. So I think uh, um, you know I think uh, you know to we uh, you know as we as we go into all these CI CDs and you know all this uh, agile way of doing things, uh, one thing I I. I I, I do believe is that uh, we can't be too agile with database uh, design. You know, we have to really think through our database design so that we minimize, uh, you know, the need of actually, uh, you know, having to, to make, uh, you know, uh, schema changes too often. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Wing Kiong. Uh, maybe I can direct the next question to Quexin uh, about what you think about decentralized ID and how public blockchain will fit into a roadmap of NDI. Okay, so um, again, um, as, as mentioned earlier, decentralized ID is uh, really proposed uh, in countries where uh, they do not have a authoritative identity 
or a foundational identity. And so uh, they rely on different um, parties to uh, perform the uh, assertion okay, uh, of, of, of the data okay, uh, about an individual. All right, and, uh, and this is related to blockchain because uh, a lot of this uh, design of distributed uh, identity uh, relies on blockchain okay, to, uh, uh, to, to determine the authenticity okay, of uh, all these assertions. All right, so uh, it's, it's a related question. Okay, so as, as mentioned earlier, all right, um, there are a couple of ways we can look at uh, decentralized ID. Uh, I personally believe that uh, it will happen. All right, uh, it may not happen so soon because we really need to uh, get the uh, all parties okay um, uh, agree agree on the frameworks okay and agree on the rules of the uh, uh, of it. And uh, there's this uh, project called the Self Sovereign identity which is um, uh, picking up uh, speed so uh, we are observing how that uh, develops okay and uh, certainly uh, we'll be keeping very close uh, um, observation of that yeah. okay thank you Kwek Sin. Uh, will be exciting to hear from you about the progress of that uh, we have one question from uh, we have one question from HQ Han uh, if there's any other countries NDI stack that we look up to as gold standard or model after ours, or we found that we could learn from, how do we compare to them? Okay, I, I don't think there's a single country that we learn from. Okay, we learn from everyone, okay, including uh, private sectors. Okay, so um, I think I, I always say that uh, there are strengths okay, of uh, different countries. For example, in Australia, uh, their strength, okay, is really about uh, defining the uh, frameworks, okay, around digital identity, and uh, and that is one country that uh, we learn from, okay, to see how we can uh, model the frameworks, okay, uh, uh, to 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 apply it, okay, uh, to Singapore as well, okay, of course with modification, all right, uh, but. If you ask me whether there is another country that is doing uh, the same, okay, as Singapore. Uh, I don't think there is one, all right? Uh, a lot of countries uh, focus their digital identity program in, uh, in issuing the identity to the citizens, all right? Uh, and uh, also um, the main use case, okay, that they try to drive is uh, to use this digital identity for government services, all right? And they leave the private sector uh, part for the private sector to, to really drive it. And so far, uh, I would say that uh, not many have successfully done that, all right, to get the private use, private sector use cases um, uh, to accept uh, that digital identity. Um, so there are pockets of successes here and there, all right, but uh, uh, we are not, we, we, are, we are in Singapore, I think um, the model that we have, uh, probably I uh, personally haven't seen it uh, in the same form uh, elsewhere in the world. Okay, thank you, Kwek Sin. Um, there's one more question from Chi Kyung. Uh, if there is a multi-cloud strategy for NDI and how that will work. Okay, I think, uh, uh, Dixon, you want to answer that? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, okay so uh, for multi-cloud, right, uh, basically it comes with its uh, complexity. Uh, we have done a couple of POCs, right, to actually evaluate uh, some of the challenges that we, we face. So first of all, you have to, uh, the design of your application, right, uh, you have to make sure that it, you do not use any uh, cloud uh, native libraries so that uh, uh, make sure your, your applications are portable. And then, uh, of course, you have to make sure across different cloud service providers, uh, the services that you're leveraging on be it the one of the managed service, uh, it needs to be available uh, on the other cloud service provider. So there, there, are, there are these challenges and uh, uh, most of the time uh, you may find the same service, but then the, the security level of this service are different, right? Uh, and another challenge uh, would be how you actually sync data across multi-cloud. Uh, and that remains a challenge, but then uh, we have actually uh, uh, 
went through a POC, right? Uh, that uh, this is actually possible because uh, being able to sync uh, data across the cloud and making sure that both cloud service provider uh, is able to uh, receive uh, uh, right data for both ends uh, is, a, is a challenge, right? So you basically need a, a tool uh, or some uh, service that is able to help you uh, uh, manage that. Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. So uh, just just to elaborate, uh, Dixon himself has uh, done this POC okay, to uh, really try out the synchronization of uh, data across uh, uh, to to CSP. All right. So uh, I think that has uh, been proven successful. But uh, I think the complexity of multi cloud is beyond us uh, data saying. Uh, so there are still uh, several areas that uh, we have to explore further. All right. Thank you, Greg Sin. Um, you want to shoot some more questions to me? Or... Okay, where will Assurity fit into NDI? All right, um, Assurity is, uh, uh, going, is, is appointed as the National Certificate Authority. All right, so as part of NDI, the certificate okay, that is uh, being issued and embedded uh, within your digital identity, uh, that the issue, the issuing party is actually uh, assuredly acting as the national digital identity, uh, national uh, certificate authority. All right, so that will be uh, their role. Um, the NAF program, which is uh, essentially uh, to issue a hard token, uh, that will eventually be uh, phase phase out. Okay, all right, and uh, they will concentrate on their role as a uh, NCA. Okay, how big is the NDI team? Okay, uh, as mentioned, we are a co-source team. Okay, so um, and there are many uh, different projects that's ongoing. One of the uh, major projects that's ongoing is actually migrating the current sync pass to the cloud. All right. So while we are building all the new uh, services, okay, of NDI on the cloud, uh, we are also moving uh, some of our uh, legacy systems okay to the cloud. Uh, so, so there are uh, quite a number of uh, uh, um, teams, okay, that is stand up, okay, to uh, perform uh, those projects. Um, so, um, but those are tem temporal, okay. So, um, at the steady state, okay, I think uh, uh, we will have a much leaner team, all right. So, uh, my expectation is, uh, uh, I, I, most of you may not know like, that is actually uh, more than fifteen systems. All right, under the NDI program, all right, and so uh, we are expecting that uh, the size of the team, all right, would uh, would would uh, come down to probably um, uh, around sixty to eighty, all right. So this is again a, a guess at this point in time. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So maybe we take one last question uh, before we end the combined Q and A. Would you like to choose one? If not, then. Um, there are many questions which might, might take a bit more time to answer, so uh, um, I think we will uh, respond uh, separately. Okay, um, let's see the top voted ones. Um, okay, I won't talk about cost here. Um, Sorry, I. Okay, is there is there anyone that uh, um, uh, Karen you want to you think is uh, or is there any uh, is there any plans for similar connectors for SingPass and CodePass? Um, yes. Okay. Um, I think the challenge that I give my guys okay uh, is that I want uh, relying parties to be able to onboard our services uh, within a day. All right. Uh, and that is that uh, aspiration that uh, we want. And in order to do that, uh, we have to make things easier for people to be able to integrate with us. Uh, so connectors is certainly one of the ways that uh, we are looking at. All right, but uh, I, again, this this is um, going to be 
something that we continuously do. Okay, so um, uh, may not be available immediately, right? Uh, but this is our exploration. Okay, thank you, Greg Sin. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the Q&A and thank you for all the presenters that shared with us today. Uh, before we go off, we wanted to do a short poll to find out how everyone feels about the session and get your feedback. Uh, so we'll be bringing up on screen uh, shortly. So if you could help tell us how do you find the webinar, it'll be very useful for our improvement. And uh, maybe as you're filling up the poll, uh, we will be taking questions through the Telegram chat, so please join us. Uh, we have shared the link on the chat, so we can continue the discussions then. So this is not the end of uh, the conversation. Okay, uh, maybe we can close the, the poll already. Okay, so uh, as mentioned just now, we will be uploading the recording of the webinar onto the developer portal. So please uh, visit us. We should be uploading it by next week. So the, the last slide uh, is to, uh, again, share the Telegram uh, chat where you can join us and ask further questions. So I think that's all we have. And um, thank you everyone for joining the session. Big thank you to Quaxin uh, and the team for sharing all the presentations and your experiences. Uh, please do keep in contact us through the Telegram channel. And thank you everyone for joining us again today.